Uh, before we get going here, I want to thank everyone from around the globe for joining us today. Looks like the turnout is already really heavy, so uh, really couldn't be a better time to sit behind your computer and learn uh, given, given the situation right now. To kick off week one, we have Stephanie Lapierre, CEO of Tealbook. Hi, thank you very much, Matt. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, people are still coming in and logging in and uh, it's, uh, you know, these are, are strange and, and difficult times. So I appreciate you taking the time to join. This is a, you know, we had launched this digital event before the crisis and I can't, you know, I, I can't believe how timely it is because we're gonna have over the next few weeks some of the most progressive and forward thinking thought leaders, people at the front lines, you know, talking to executive teams in procurement every week, every day. And we also have procurement executives that are facing some of the challenges that you're facing at this very moment. So over the next eight weeks, I'm sure things will change quite a bit and, uh, and they're gonna be able to bring their experiences and some of the best practices or the things that they're hearing from the industry and sharing that with you. Um, so to kick off, I'm thrilled to kick off the first uh, webinar uh, out of the eight week series. We have uh, for the next seven weeks after this, we're gonna have uh, Chris Sasha on April 1st, uh, talking about the current state of e-procurement and how to think about the future. Uh, I've seen Chris uh, speak at several conferences. Uh, he's, you know, he's, he sits on a ton of information from the Hackett Group. Uh, he also is right now um, in the front line with executive team trying to figure out and hearing two sides from companies who are very rapidly looking at cutting expenses um, and have to respond really, really fast to others that can't keep up with the demand and we're not ready to scale. And so kind of two ends of the spectrum of a crisis, some that you know, or maybe not benefiting as much as others. And so uh, he'll share his perspective there, but also talk about, you know, why data is so important to the future of procurement. And in this time, agility uh, is, is really, really key. On April 8th, we'll have Dr. Eloise Epstein. Uh, I don't know if you've seen Eloise speak at uh, conferences, but she's bold. Uh, she doesn't apologize. Uh, she really shares what she's seen, and it's founded into years of experiences working with very forward-thinking procurement leaders. And she'll talk specifically about the future state. She's been talking about the future state for a long time, and now it's materializing uh, itself really, really fast with the digital transformation, and more so now with uh, the crisis. And so she'll talk about the emerging technologies and what infrastructure is required for the future. On April 15, we'll have Walter Charles, another uh, prominent speaker. Uh, Walter is also incredibly bold. He's taking some, some chances and made some bold decisions throughout his career. I was very fortunate to uh, work with him when he was the CPO at Biogen. He's now at Allergan. He's been prior to that, the CPO at Kellogg, Kraft, J&J. &J. And Walt has really leveraged technologies, even when we were early uh, in our development with Tealbook, he foresaw the vision and brought us in to start leveraging some of the data uh, to be able to accomplish some really, really big things in each of the organization that he's worked with. So really fortunate to have him join us and talk about the fact that the future is not the future. The future is now and time is really essential and the technology is here today to enable that to happen. On April 22nd, uh, I have a personal friend uh, who uh, is also working uh, with us, uh, Tim Harrod was uh, the CPO at uh, Protash and then became Nutrient. And he did some massive multi-million dollar enterprise-wide transformation leading with technologies. And he's now the CPO at Federated Cooperatives. And he had a chance to do sort of start with a clean slate and decided to lead his transformation with a strong data foundation first. And so really interesting to hear more of the practical side of why it's so important to think about data first and technology after versus the other way around and some of the pitfall that procurement teams have been facing and investing so fast in technologies without a data strategy. On April 29th, we'll have our very own Matt Palagdari, who's our head of commercial strategy and sales. And Matt comes from the industry. Uh, he was part of the executive team of one of the fastest growing procurement technologies and that was acquired by Krupa about two years ago. 
and we're very fortunate that Matt's joined our team uh, this past year. And uh, he will be talking about what he saw and why he's joined um, a data company, uh, mostly from experience and having worked in the industry in our space for a long time. And we're, we've been hearing from all the analysts and the thought leaders, um, you know, about whichever way that they are saying it. We've heard uh, Data Lake with AI Hub, we've heard Intelligence Layer, um, all kinds of words to define what this, this uh, technology, what is required for that future infrastructure. So Matt will speak directly to solution. And then we'll, uh, on May 6th, we'll have Jeff Petal, who is our CTO. Uh, Jeff probably doesn't get as much um, visibility just because he's mostly uh, working on the tech side. But Jeff, uh, his, his experience came from working at Google, spent 10 years at Ariba when Ariba was building the supplier network and catalogs. And prior to that was at IBM. Uh, Jeff has two masters in computer sciences. Uh, his last master was focused in machine learning. Uh, he's also on the committee of the University of Toronto for the machine learning program and working very closely with the Vector Institute, which is the AI Institute in Toronto. And so Jeff will be talking about the technology and the power of an autonomous uh, data enrichment platform to be added to an ecosystem and, and how we're able to do that. And then I'll wrap up on May 13th. Uh, I think, I, you know, Part of it, I'll be hearing all of these different presentations. So I'll definitely summarize and provide my views, but I will also be announcing uh, the results from a study we did with Wakefield. Um, and so I'm thrilled to be able to present that research and that validates our path forward. Now, a few housekeeping. We have on the right-hand side, some handouts. So uh, if, you, if you are interested in downloading some content from today, Please, you can just add it uh, just on your uh, go to webinar. Uh, there's a handout there with PDF. And if you have questions, we're going to compile questions. And at the end of the session, Matt will run through the questions uh, and I'll answer them. So please don't be shy, raise your questions, and uh, we'll address them uh, towards the end of the session. Now, one of the things that um, is, is so obvious to me when I, I, I have the, I'm very fortunate to present at a lot of procurement conferences. And in the last six, seven months, what I've been starting my presentation with are three key and simple questions. Um, I typically start by asking the audience to raise their hand if they have some confidence in the quality and the completeness of their supplier data. And as you can imagine, Right, everyone smiles, everyone looks around, and no one raised their hand. And then I, I usually start, the next question is raise your hand if you have, if you believe that good quality and complete supplier data is absolutely critical to your digital transformation. And typically 100% of the audience raises their hands. And I, I've added recently a third question about who here has invested in a cloud based S2P or P2P solution in the past 24 months. And you get, you know, typically about three quarters of the audience. These are all executive of Fortune 1000 companies. Um, and it lands itself incredibly well. If we all believe that good quality and complete supplier data is absolutely critical to the success of our digital transformation, but no one is able to confidently say that they have it, we have a huge data gap. There's a huge data problem that is, that the more data that's coming out, that's crippling <clears throat> the investment that we're making into our digital transformation and our technology. In fact, Gartner claims that 75% of IT project will fail, not because of the software, but because of the data and the poor quality of it. And so this is not just my thoughts or <clears throat> you know, how we share at conferences, but there's a lot of studies out there that are supporting that uh, you know, having a strong data strategy and a strong data foundation is really critical to procurement. And so we've highlighted today five that uh, I believe, you know, um, are supporting, have a lot of credibility behind it, but are supporting some of the statements that should help you think about how are you going to move forward with a strong data stra strategy and the importance and be able to quantify the importance of a strong data foundation. And that's what you're going to be hearing over the next uh, seven weeks or over the next eight weeks. And so I want to highlight uh, two studies uh, on the right hand side is the 2018 uh, supplier uh, governance uh, study or data governance study and that study was uh, sponsored by IBM 
Uh, it in involved over a thousand supply chain executives. It's one of the most comprehensive studies. And this was a thir three year uh, in a row that they've gathered data and they revisited uh, the data in 2019. And this time it was sponsored by iValua. And what I want to point out here is that even the technology companies who are uh, software companies are in investing in supporting the statement that data is really critical. And what we've seen is that you know, over the last couple of years, companies and procurement teams have truly flocked towards these uh, cloud-based uh, software companies as a solution to digitize and lead their digital transformation. And that's because the industry has been advocating it and they've been telling a really, really good story. Of course, cloud technology is key and it's, it's, a, it's the evolution of digital transformation. But without data being automated and being validated and be flowing within those systems in a way that it's accurate and trusted and useful, uh, it's very difficult to capitalize on your investment. And so what we've seen more and more now is that you know, there's, there's overrun budget, there's uh, delays, there's failures in uh, P2P implementation typically caused by poor data quality. And we've heard stories like the city of New York who um, went $54 million over budget to implement one of the cloud-based S2P solutions. So, um, you know, that's typically a result of, of industry trends. But again, just going back to my questions at conferences, even though the investment has been significant, no one still can answer uh, a simple question as to you have confidence in your supplier data. And we're not talking about specifically transactional data. We're talking about all the completeness of the information that the organization and procurement should have access to. Um, and so moving to, uh, you know, one of the, 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 the study or the talk I'm going to talk about is uh, Joe Yakura. Uh, Joe uh, was, you know, tons of experience as a CPO. Joe was, uh, you know, at Fannie Mae, CPO at Fannie Mae, at American Express, IHG, Bank of America. And he's incredibly passionate and dedicated to, uh, to data governance, data quality. He's driven some of the governance studies as well. And so, um, and he's founded recently the International Association of Data Quality, Governance and Analytics. And I'm fortunate enough to have been invited to be on the board. So I'm looking forward to collaborating with Joe um, as well moving forward. Um, and then I want to point out the, on the right hand side, uh, the article in yellow, which is the supply market intelligence study. And this is from Rob Hanfield. I'm sure you all have heard of or have read his uh, publications. Uh, Rob is another prominent uh, thought leaders in our space. And what I like about this study the most is really looking at the, the long-term way to build team for the long run. And so um, I'll point out some of the, of the facts or some of the data that came out of that, um, that study. And then finally from Splunk, um, the, we're going to be talking about quantifying data. This is a study that looks at data well beyond procurement or supply chain, but it's about quantifying the value of data, either from a commercial purpose or to drive decision uh, or to be able to maximize that investment into technologies. And often what we're hearing is that it's hard to uh, build an ROI story for data because data has been overlooked in the past, even though Everyone agrees that data is bad and data needs to be resolved. Uh, I think it's been such a monumental task in the past for procurement teams to um, to take this on because it, it's been sort of you know multiple antiquated ways and it still results in stale and poor data quality. And so either you know some teams have given up altogether um, or they're they're still trying and it's uh, it's very very costly and it's to to redo. Uh, over and over again. So let's dive in into um, some of the, the, the data points of the studies that I uh, made a reference to. Um, you know, the, 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 the 2018 um, annual data governance study, that was, um, that was, again, sponsored by IBM. It showed that 75% um, of businesses say that poor quality data has made it challenging to achieve their digital transformation plans. 89% of them have said that meeting their digital transformation plans will require structured data migration. 73% of businesses say that they lack the necessary talent to drive their digital transformation plan, which is not shocking. And 92% of businesses believe that high quality data is the fuel 
to their digital transformation. And I, I couldn't agree more. Um, you know, these stats are really high and they're all pointing to the same thing is the importance of having a strong data foundation. And on the last point, we sort of joke often and you'll hear Chris Soshak, uh presentation. I hope he does bring the Ironman analogy of having uh, procurement being sort of the human and having the technology as the armor but without that arc reactor, the technology really doesn't mean anything. And so you need all the pieces, you need the fuel, you need the technology, and you need the brains behind it to, to build a strategy and, uh, and maximize that digital transformation. And then in 2019, so again, this was sponsored by iValua, same study revisited again, uh, where it was, uh, they interviewed over a thousand or surveyed over a thousand, I apologize, surveyed over a thousand supply chain executives uh, on what stops them from mastering their digital complexity. And so, um, you know, here I think what's really important to highlight is that 60% said that poor master data quality standardization and governance is stopping them from mastering digi digital complexities. And 40% said they have the inability to generate analytics and insights across systems. And that's not shocking if you don't have good data it's very difficult to get the type of insight that you can take action on. And then all the way down to number nine, only 12% says that poor tools and processes inhibit them from mastering digital complexities. So I wanna point out here that it's not the technology, the tools and the processes that are getting in the way, it's actually not having a good data foundation or having good quality data that's mostly um, you know, preventing procurement from achieving its full value to the organization. On the supply market intelligence study, um, you know, what was really fascinating is organization with top ranked supply market intelligence program may not necessarily excel in their data collection. And so even though a lot of efforts are being put to have, you know, either outsource market intelligence or build market intelligence team, it's actually not uh, allowing them to collect data in, in the most effective way. And so uh, I think that's really interesting and that there's a growing trend towards outsourcing of market intelligence, data collection, synthesis, analysis, and reporting. And I think we're all familiar with this. Most companies have, at some point have thought they could do this on their own and build internal resources. And we've seen a lot of failures with that. And so it's normal that there's a migration to outsourcing Unfortunately, most of the outsourcing options are antiquated. It's either stale lists, databases, market research that are, you know, one snapshot into the market. Uh, even when we look at spend data, it's a rear view mirror of looking at spend, which can be useful, but not nearly as useful as you can start building analytics that allows you to be much more predictive. So spend data is one view of your suppliers. It's, it's one of so many other um, dimensions to be able to formalize faster, better decisions and be able to build really uh, sustainable and successful strategies. And looking at most organizations do not link their market intelligence report and insight into operational decision making. So it's almost like, what's the point? <laughs> you know, spending a lot of time and money in market intelligence and it's not actually being used because typically it doesn't get in the hands of the business. And so even though we may have <clears throat> all this intelligence, if we're not the forefront and working with teams, uh, if we haven't positioned ourselves as a value add to driving some of those operational business decision, then it's basically worthless. Or maybe it's not trusted because if it's one snapshot and it's not doesn't have all the the context and the perspective of what drives that intelligence, it may be very difficult to gain the trust that the business requires to include those into their operational decision making. And so moving on to mastering the procurement data challenge um, by Joe Yakura, uh, what do you really, and I really encourage you, please download this. Uh, it's on Art of Procurement. Uh, I don't know if we have, hopefully we have the resource on the right-hand side, but um, it's with Phil Idison, and it's a great interview that happened only a few weeks ago. And it would be interesting to have Joe do an interview again in the context of our current situation. But what he talks about is that the, the, the data challenge, not just a matter of quality, it's also a matter of time. A lot of team, I'm hearing this all the time that they have, you know, a big P2P implementation, so they don't really have time to think about the data. 
it's crazy to me to not think about data first and then building the technology on top of it because the implementation itself, the speed of the implementation, the coverage of the information and not having to rely on suppliers to come and fill in a, a portal, which they don't, then you have to end up you know, hiring third party resources. How does that not happen faster and better? And so what he points out is that uh, the survey from, from this year said that, that uh, respondents spend 25% more time looking for data than the, the past year, the year before. And so we're talking about 16 to 25%. It's a, it's a significant increase when you're thinking about the amount of information that needs to be collected. And one of the studies points out that there's, uh, there's 40% more data year after year, and that will start exponentially grow. And so we're gonna spend more and more time looking for information unless we have automation and information comes to us in a way that we can take action on. And then the data quality is an enterprise-wide problem and, and such any sustainable solution has to be cross-functional and procurement should work with any other team in the company that has access to significant data. And, you know, I had a conversation, uh, Workday and Ventures invested in Tailbook in our last round and we were talking to their team and they talked about the fact that large companies like the Informatica are building these data lakes for organization and one of the, the problem or the challenges for supply chain and procurement is that it's not typically uh, the data uh, that is being prioritized. And so if you're in procurement and supply chain, maybe now things will change with the crisis, but traditionally other data points have been more important. And we're looking at a data lake that's limited to the organization, which has some value, but doesn't capitalize necessarily on the full potential. And if procurement is not prioritized, that means that you have to wait a really long time for that data to be modeled in a way or mined in a way that's useful for procurement. And so if there's alternatives to that, if there's ways to um, be more proactive in bringing that data, or automating data and building a strong data foundation, um, you're getting way ahead of, um, you know, of what may be being done at the enterprise wide. At the same time, it's really important to look at other data points because the completeness of the information across the organization impacts the customers, impacts employees, impacts you know, so many other data points that may be coming from manufacturing that if used in collaboration with, uh, with procurement related supplier data or transactional data or catalog data, it can be incredibly insightful. But again, you need automation because that would be overwhelming. Uh, but working with teams, looking across the organization as to who else has data that you can start leveraging is really, really uh, important and can, can you know, drive uh, significant value to the company. And finally, the global value of data. Um, what it highlights is that organization with strong strategic emphasis on data will remove an average of 4.85% from their annual operating costs via better use of data. And so this is you know, significant if we're thinking about a billion dollars in spend, and I know some of you are you know, multi-billion dollars in spend, this represents $48.5 million in savings in annual operating costs. So not an insignificant impact. And then the study also highlights the five emphasis uh, around uh, data being speed. So we need to access information faster. Uh, we need to be able to respond to the needs of the market and the business faster. And I'm sure you know everyone's feeling this right now with COVID. Um, you know, and one of the things that has come to mind and it's coming through publications is even I, I posted something on Coca-Cola this morning. The CEO is saying that the supply chain is really impacted. So this is coming, you know, from the top of Coca-Cola saying, and it's not necessarily that they're directly impacted, but some of their manufacturers may be shifting focus. Uh, some of their suppliers may be going out of business or maybe in countries where people are not showing up to work. And so, you know, thinking about um, speed and being the first, right? If you have a scarce supply chain, you've got competitors, direct or indirect competitors that are looking and sourcing for the same goods and services. So getting ahead and, and use this as a competitive advantage, like this is our chance, right? We've talked about getting a seat at the table if you're able to find uh, additional sources and be able to, um, you know, I mean, it could be, it could actually mean complete disruption or, 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 or coming outside of this crisis in a really strong position. Um, and when we talk about the second point is scale, 
uh, in the past, you know, if we buy market intelligence, who actually access that data? If we talk about portals, who actually uses the portal? Uh, is the portal available at scale? Is the data accurate at scale? Do we have validated records across all our systems? Um, probably not. And so thinking about the future of enablement of having employees use the information that's given to them by procurement to drive decisions across the entire organization and globally is really important. And so uh, scale and how do you scale that data? Uh, again, you know, looking at automation and, and technologies today like machine learning, AI, big data, really important. Uh, impartiality, uh, we all know in the past and we try to do a better job having you know decisions founded on data. Typically that comes from looking at RFPs that are extensive and benchmarking RFPs. Um, but we know that a lot of decisions are more, um, I've been in the past, especially when it comes to the business, typically it comes to relationship base or um, maybe having you know uh, a, a relationship or you, you feel good about a supplier versus these are decisions that are founded on data and these this, these decisions are the best possible outcome because we have the analytics to predict that this is actually going to be a, a good partnership or a good outcome to the business. And then precision, not only you have to access data, but the data has to be good and it has to be trusted and has to be transparent. So looking at the future, like data changes so fast, especially now, how do you keep up? You can't keep up with portals and, and SharePoint. You need to keep up with real-time information to be able to use that information to drive decisions and then the uptime. You know, we see you know multi-million dollars investment in technologies that are taking years to implement we just don't have that luxury anymore and so if you are able to automate data into your your your, your cloud system in a way that can do it right away cover a hundred percent of your suppliers not be able to rely on IT to connect platforms or systems to each other but have much better way to roll out the technology one, you're going to get a lot faster to implement and, and, and deploy. You're going to drive a lot more compliance to those systems, and you're not bound to them. It's sort of the analogy of the cell phone. Back in the days when my when my cell when I lose my cell phone and had to email all my contacts asking them to send me their their phone numbers, um, you know, times have changed. Now, if I lose my cell phone, yeah, it's money, um, but my data is the same data that's connected to my iPad, my iWatch, my laptop. And so I'm not bound by the technology anymore, right? I can I can go and buy the latest cell phone or the latest computer, and there's very little friction. So thinking about uptime and be able to not being bound to your decision to invest in technology. So that means shorter terms agreement with the software companies and the ability to um, rip and replace with maybe better, faster technologies as, as we evolve really, really fast. And so, you know, what I talked about earlier about procurement teams running to uh, technology, it makes sense because when you're looking at software, it's very tangible. It's something that you can see. And, and you know, if I look at how we built houses, you know, I would be tempted to want to just buy or see, or if I'm selling, I'm looking at the aesthetic, I'm looking at something that's really tangible. But if the house is not built on a strong foundation, it will crumble. And this is how I think about our technology ecosystem. And as we you know, have an ERP and an STP or P2P, we add maybe a sourcing tool, we'll add a contract management system, a third party uh, management system, a diversity portal, a sustainability portal, a quality portal, a safety portal, and it just goes on and on and on. And most of the time, those data points are not connected to give you that unified view. Um, and then we don't have a strong foundation, then we can't maximize that investment. So very similar analogy to um, you know, how we built and how we can, can have a strong foundation in something as simple as building a house. And then I just want to point out, you know, I'm, I'm in Toronto and, and became a Raptors fan over the last couple of years. I'm French Canadian, so basketball was far away from hockey, but uh, the Raptors and all the energy that we uh, faced in Toronto was really fun this past year. But if we look at the NBA, what we can learn, uh, they made a data first transition. And when we used to, to watch, it was just a game on TV it, and we couldn't really predict among many data points, the NBA want to learn whether like a shot was taking was a really good one or not. What were the chances of a shot getting in or not to the basket? 
Um, and so we, you know, they, um, in order to do that, they had to create a data technology that measured where the shots were taking and which one actually would go in. And from that, if you fast forward, we can now see in real time the percentage chances that a shot will actually go in. And in modern age of basketball, you'd expect that team that uses these insights to be the best to win. And so I'm not just saying that the Raptors won last year, but uh, you know, talent has a lot to do with it, but talent plus using data to make predictions to be able to build better strategies uh, makes one the game a lot more fun to watch. And we can now start predicting teams that have the greatest chance of winning. So it sort of puts the two and, and create uh, sort of on steroid. And you know, being in Toronto, we're very, very fortunate to be uh, um, you know, in the mecca of AI, not a lot of you probably know, but the AI and machine learning comes from Toronto. The University of Toronto Machine Learning Program is the, one of the most well-recognized uh, program in the world. And so we'd like to think that we're using uh, some of the same uh, talent pool uh, from the University of Toronto as the Raptors. On that note, I'm, I'm gonna move to questions. So Matt, can you Thanks. still hear me? Okay. Yes, we can. Thanks for that, Steph. And we actually have a fair amount of questions. Some of you are ahead of me. Uh, the first question has a lot of overlap. So uh, what data elements are critical to consider as part of your data foundation? Um, you know, it's, it's, um, it's everything. It's, 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 today we've been focused on either transactional or spend data at the most. And we kind of forget how important having the whole picture, the completeness of the information on your suppliers. And I'm just gonna run through like basic information that coming together can really give you um, uh, all the insight required to drive those decisions. So things like capabilities, we talk about you know even categorization, it's done manually, so automating categorization, and then go deeper, what those suppliers actually do using natural language. You know, if you're able to find what suppliers do, you can leverage them so much more effectively and you can, you don't have to find code or having to do drop down. And then looking at uh, differences, you know, uh, trends between those companies in, in different ways. So looking at what makes clusters of suppliers that do exactly the same things versus, uh, well, that could drive a strategy around consolidation versus maybe, um, you know, and your vendor master seeing that there's maybe not enough suppliers in a category, and those are opportunities where in the world there's a lot of suppliers that are similar, so that can can increase competitiveness. Um, things like contact information, like the, the amount of times we see SharePoint, Excel form, portals trying to keep up with contact information, but what if there's a recall or a change of policy or something that's really significant? Most procurement teams cannot communicate with their entire vendor master. Uh, in real time. That's because contact information is hard to find, it's hard to maintain. Um, and then, you know, even in a sourcing environment, when you're looking at email um, contacts to be able to just even send an RFX, an RFI, that takes time. And if you take five minutes per contact that you need to find per the time, the number of suppliers per sourcing event, for the number of sourcing event, we're talking like hours and hours wasted of tactical time looking for contact information. A parent and child super important. Um, if your customers, if your suppliers are also customers, can be incredibly valuable when you're thinking about your negotiation strategy or finding ways to collaborate differently. Risk we know is really critical. Most third-party risk management solution requires supplier to be fed into into them. So when you're looking at uh, the completeness, the transparency of the information increases the chance of uh, mitigating your risk, but also looking at the financial, political, social element of risk. Uh, contact, or sorry, um, and banking information, certificates, insurance certificate, tax form, those are all maintained through various onboarding portal. Suppliers have to update hundreds to thousands of them each time they do business. It's very difficult to keep up the date. So a lot of teams are spending or outsourcing this, which is incredibly time consuming. And frankly, as we're hearing a lot from banks, it, it, it increases the number of frauds um, that are happening because a lot of that data exchange is done by email. And then all the certification, ISO, GDPR, diversity, sustainability, and the list goes on and on. And oh, those are all data point today that lives in different portals because it addressed different functions um, and they all need to be continuously grabbed, validated, reported, and that's an another monumental task. So if you put all of that data together, plus the analytics and the insight, 
we're talking about a much bigger view of uh, who you do business with or who you should do business with. Great, thanks for that, Steph. We have another question, and this is what critical functionalities are needed to building a data foundation? You know, um, what I don't think you actually really need a lot of infrastructure for that. You need to have access to your data, and it doesn't need to be, you know, all the data, it's just need data pool or integration to your system. And so um, I think back when we would do this in antiquated ways, it requires a lot of infrastructure as if we think of today, you need very little. Um, companies that like, in, and I'm not trying to be overly promotional, but companies like us, uh, you're able to do a data pool or an integration and then bring your data to life. And, and systems like us are building integration that plugs into your other uh, solutions so you don't have to even use IT resources to try to connect systems to each other. If you have a cloud-based data foundation um, that uses autonomous supplier data enrichment, you're able to then make that data, you have the mechanism to make that data better and be able to distribute across your system. So I'd say that you need a lot less, um, a lot less infrastructure that you would need in the past. Okay, great. A little bit different topic here. So how do you think about hiring machine learning talent? Um, I'd say that, you know, hiring data scientists is incredibly difficult. Um, and, and when companies tend to want to invest in, in hiring and bring in data scientists, one, they need to know what good data scientists look like. And the failure rate has been pretty high. So my perspective is I wouldn't recommend bringing ML talent in-house. Uh, when I think of, um, you know, and this is really highly, high, it's highlighted in the supply and market intelligence study, I'd say, you know, even the way that Jeff or CTO manages our engineering team versus the data team, the data team is very research-based. Um, they are there to build models that mine a lot of data to be able to solve, you know, problems. And one, you need to have the data and often data scientists are being brought to clean data versus using the data to build models. So I'd say to not invest in, in building a machine learning team, let's, um, you know, there's, there's, there's companies um, that do invest heavily in machine learning and just tap into that pool of talent uh, or, you know, buy a solution that's basically off the shelf that includes, uh, like it's sort of the analogy of building Google or using Google. If you're trying to attempt to build Google, you're probably not gonna do as, as, as good of a job of using Google directly. We have a lot of overlap in the next question. I think it's very timely, but where do you think supply chains will go post the, uh, the COVID-19 crisis? I think it's gonna highlight the importance of supply chain and procurement to the viability of most organization. Um, I think it comes down to, we've talked about agility for a really long time, but there's no better time than when you're in crisis to realize how important agility to supply chain and procurement is. And so I think there'll be a very strong focus on, um, you know, looking at the risks that, that companies have taken and the ones that do survive and do well will have a lot more, um, a lot stronger strategy around their supply chain and specifically looking at ways to invest in technologies that will bring more visibility and agility to driving decisions. And so I'm hearing a lot of articles already, even in our world of, you know, we are BC backed, uh, looking at where venture capital will go. They're talking a lot about investing in supply chain visibility because it's, it's not a moment like now where resources are scarce. It's very difficult to find local suppliers. There tend to be smaller businesses. And if you have to go global, it's very competitive. And so I'd say supply supply chain agility is a word that we're gonna we're gonna certainly use it and we're gonna hear a lot more of. Okay, we have uh, one last question here. The rest of the questions we will pull together and follow up separately. Um, but an individual was reading your bio and found that you are a mother of three girls, a founder of both a, co a consulting company and a fast growing tech company. How do you balance it all? <laughs> um, you know, it's uh, I, th I think it comes down to having an amazing team. I do have an incredible team that is, um, you know, um, I've stepped in in a big way. And what, as you grow and talent becomes more, um, more, um, you know, 
prominent, uh, this for me has been transformative, finding people that can really uh, step in and, and bring value to the organization in a way that, um, you know, a smaller team couldn't do. So for me, a lot has to do with you joining us and, and our executive team and all the talent that's joined. It's allowing me to focus on the things that I'm, I'm really good at. Uh, and bring the most value to our company. And then just having a great support system at home. I'm very fortunate to have a husband entrepreneur who understands that what I'm doing is significant. And uh, and I'm really passionate. I have three daughters and I tell them, you know, constantly how I love what I do and they see it. And, um, you know, I think they see that and they respect it. And so they don't push back if I have to travel, which I will do a lot less <laughs> in the coming weeks at, or work a lot. And so actually I'm, I'm at home. I've asked them to spend 45 minutes of quiet time. They've been very respectful. Uh, it doesn't always happen. So in the last week, it's been challenging as I'm, most of you I'm sure are experiencing. But um, you know, I, I, I smile 98% of the time and that's my sanity check. And, and you have to love and be passionate about what, you, what you're building. Well, thank you for the, the answers there, Steph, and thanks for the, the quick shout out. Uh, for everybody on the line here today, we, uh, we really appreciate you joining us for session one of the eight-week series. We will be launching these every Wednesday for the next seven weeks uh, following this, and, uh, and every time it will start at noon Eastern time. Up next, we have Chris Sawchuk of the Hackett Group, and this is uh, honestly probably the speech that I'm looking forward to most. So we hope that you can join us next week uh, at, at noon. Thank you, everybody. And uh, we will see you next week. Yeah, thank you, everyone, for joining. Have a great rest of your day.